Hey guys, and welcome back to the Yes it Means Yes podcast. On this week's episode, we are going to be discussing vulnerable populations and sexual assault. As usual, my name is Faith Nomchev, and I'm the Prevention Educator with Rape Counselors, and I'm going to let our guests introduce themselves. Um, and I am Holland. I'm the Victim Advocate with Rape Counselors of East Alabama. Um, I'm Lauren Carter. I'm a nurse. I'm Maggie McBride. I work at the Exceptional Foundation of East Alabama. And I'm Piper Hughes, and I also work at the Exceptional Foundation of East Alabama. Awesome. Okay, so you guys kind of discussed um, what your roles and what you do in your jobs. Do you mind going further into um, what your organization your job does and what your role is within that um, organization or job? Um, okay, so we can go ahead and start. Um, so the Exceptional Foundation is a place where adults with special needs come, and it's like a day program, and um, we work with them on different skills, both physical, cognitive, um, social skills, and things like that. So I do home health, so I get to go to people's houses after they've had surgery or um even people who sometimes uh, get to leave assisted living and come home um, or any kind of cognitive decline, I get to go in and um, we just kind of keep up with their plan of care and um, physical occupational therapy is also involved. A lot of education, lots of education. Awesome. Um, in either of y'all's roles, um, have y'all been given any training in regards to preventing or recognizing sexual violence? I feel like during my orientation, that was just like being bombarded with coursework that lasted for like three days. It was probably mentioned, but I would not say that we're educated extensively at all in recognizing that. Mm-mm. Okay. What about y'all, Piper and Maggie? Do you think that y'all have been given any sort of training on it? Yeah, for sure. Um, we go in a lot. Um, we have gotten restraint trained uh, through Glenwood, which is like a, an ABA program with a school. Um, and so we've had Glenwood come in and do restraint training. If there's any type of, like with our population, it might not always be ill-willed, um, but it still can be a sexual assault. Um, and so if that's the case, so we have that under our belts. And also like him as an ABA, we had a, his name was Bobby came through and did an ABA training. Um, so we worked on a lot of behavior management in general and just like what to look for and stuff like that. So absolutely. Okay. Awesome. So I guess some of y'all feel a little bit more equipped than others. And I know like, especially we've seen, when you are getting bombarded with all of that information, sometimes it does just get hit on quickly and brushed under the rug. So, you know, that's why things like this are good. Maybe it'll reach the ears of some nurses or someone else working with vulnerable populations. So. Yes, definitely. Um, and in your work, have you guys ever had a situation where you were forced to intervene um, in an instance of potential sexual violence or, you know, react after the fact, after maybe a client or, when you serve experience sexual violence or sexual assault um so thankfully at um the exceptional foundation we have not had to um deal with anything like that or had any situations where we've had to intervene or had any sexual violence go on however we do have that training um, restraint training and we are trained to like see the visual um some of the visual uh indicators of uh, sexual violence so where we haven't had to use it yet we do have you know the ability to um, respond if something were to happen yeah. and we've definitely um, had a few situations with some minor physical violent physical violence reports and things like that um, just things like Piper said that we've just visually seen or had a participant mention um, because they are comfortable with us um, so different comments and things like that, but have luckily not yet led to anything that involves intervening in like a sexual assault. I feel like for me, um, especially working in home health, when I, when I used to work in a nursing home, it was something that we looked for more often, especially when someone was first admitted um, into the nursing home, you know, full assessment and asking lots of questions. Um, but 
as a home health nurse, you know, sometimes we don't see the whole picture. And so, no, I've never, you know, come across anything like that. Um, sexual abuse wise, I have come across neglect. So, you know, elder abuse comes in like lots of different ways. And so thankfully I have been trained to recognize that, but I feel like once again, with, with uh, the elderly population, sexual abuse isn't really thought about as much, even though it could be very well possible. And so something that I definitely would like to, you know, be able to recognize in a short instance when I'm literally only in the home for an hour and a half when we're admitting them, you know, for sure. Um, y'all both kind of hit on this a little bit, but do you think that the populations that y'all both work with would feel comfortable disclosing, um, if sexual violence was happening? I know that y'all, um, exceptional foundation might have a longer like history with them and work with them a lot more. And Lauren, you said sometimes you're only in the home for an hour so um, I guess just y'all speak a little bit on that if you think that they would feel comfortable um, in disclosing that information to y'all. That was a really good question. Um, I had a lot to think about on that one. Piper and I both did when we discussed it. But um, there's definitely different points to that one. I feel like if they were assaulted and half of them knew that it was assault, then yeah, they definitely do feel comfortable with us. Um, but that's a big thing. Do they even know that they're being so sexually assaulted um and like we kind of touched on earlier is um they're often just like desensitized to touch in general just from daily living like in the home care work being bathed and changed and going to the restroom and feeding and everything um so the lines are often blurred you know with that and so it's more so about getting education out there for adults with special needs to recognize the difference you know now that I think about it even like when I'm in the home there's like tons of questions I'm asking and it's usually about depression and anxiety when it comes to like personal you know things that they talk that we talk about um and I you know that's just not something that's even part of our evaluation um but I do think that um, that some of these populations would be comfortable talking about it, but it would also be kind of hard because usually if there's a caregiver, they're going to be present, you know, during every visit, admission, discharge, anything, and it could be the caregiver. So it'd be kind of hard to single, single them out, you know, talk to them by themselves. Yeah, sure. I think that's the thing that's super special about the foundation is that we do get that one-on-one -on -one time with them and we are with them so much during the day and we do like get those one-on-one -on -one connections and we are like for most of them we are second family so we do have like they do feel comfortable coming to us with like really anything so I think it's important to like recognize when they are trying to speak up and like tell us about things like that because oftentimes like if something were to happen they in their own way would verbalize that to us because they are so comfortable and a lot of them do kind of overshare because we are second family. Yeah. Um, and I had actually pulled some statistics for this just to kind of show the prevalence because Lauren's touched on this. Um, you know, you don't really think about this happening within these populations or we don't want to think about it happening. Um, mm -hmm. And so when Lauren mentioned the caregiver thing, uh, one of the statistics I found said that um, around 80% of the time, the perpetrator of sexual abuse for elderly um, was done by the caregiver. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that's one of the reasons why it's so difficult to spot it and why it's not talked about because it's like the person who is supposed to be taking care of them and is kind of like basically their voice at that point. Um, another statistic that I found that had to deal with individuals with um, disabilities said that people with intellectual disabilities are sexually assaulted at a rate seven times higher than those without disabilities. Right. Um, so these statistics are staggering, but probably something that we don't, you know, see because people don't want to talk about it. First of all, people don't talk about sexual assault, but then with the vulnerable populations, they definitely don't want to talk about sexual assault. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, I'm sorry, that sexual abuse sorry, can also look really different in people with disabilities. Uh, like sexual assault can come in like forced abortions. Um, sterilizations kind of thing um, that's often not always their choice and that's also just like another way but yeah the blurred lines of exposure and just 
inappropriate things done by caregivers and all kinds of stuff like that is just really if they know the difference then it would be I feel like a lot different but it's the people that they're supposed to trust so unfortunately yeah and I thank you for bringing up those examples too because that's something that you know I wouldn't have to even thought of but those are prime examples of um sexual abuse that are done to them because of their um disabilities so going kind of off of this in your experience or basically you know anything that you've kind of seen or maybe learned what would you say would be some barriers um, to your populations for reporting? And, you know, how would this affect the help that they may or may not receive? Um, so I think one thing that we um, especially run into at the Exceptional Foundation would be just the communication abilities um, for many of them. Um, so like Maggie touched on earlier, if they do know and understand what is happening to them is wrong or, you know, they do feel like, oh, like this isn't right many of them don't know the proper way to communicate that or how to explain what is happening to them because they may not know um they may not know the correct term to use or um it may just be like an everyday thing for them and they're used to it and they don't feel the need to communicate it to us um because it is so normal i guess to them if it does happen on a daily basis so I think definitely one of the biggest things would be communication um, and really understanding this is, I am being uh, like sexually assaulted or whatever it may be. Um, so it's a little bit different for them to understand and communicate those things to us. Yeah, I think that's the biggest difference. Other than that, I mean, they feel and hurt the same exact way as anybody else that would suffer from a sexual abuse would. Um, you know, scared of family not believing, scared of getting in trouble for, you know, if they did the wrong thing or behaved in the wrong ways, um, or, you know, just if it is the family member that's doing it, the perpetrating, then, like, it would just make their matters worse. Um, and then, you know, one other thing that Piper and I kind of thought about is if it's not nipped in the bud in the beginning, you know, being at, like, early age in schools, they're really, like, pounding on, like, socialization and, like, social cues and social behaviors and all that. And so it's just, like, learned submission and compliance conditioned in the classroom. And so oftentimes it can hinder just, like, they think that they're supposed to be submissive in return for learned that they get rewards, you know, so... It is a lot of um, going off of that kind of a coercion behind it because a lot of them are. So we um, have, we are all very intrinsically motivated. However, a lot of um, people with special needs are very extrinsically motivated. So you do the correct behavior, you get rewarded with whatever it ice may cream, be, ice cream, tablet, tablet yeah. an activity or freedom to do something. So attention. they can, yeah, attention for a lot of them. Um, they'll do whatever it takes to get, because they, they want to be loved just as much as, um, you know, everybody does. So they are very motivated by, oh, if I do this, they'll love me. If I do this, then I'll get tablet time. If I do this, I'll get ice cream, like um, Maggie was saying. Um, so a lot of them can be coerced very easy into doing things that they may not be comfortable with or that are very inappropriate because they want that extrinsic reward and they see it as, oh, I'm doing a good thing because I'm getting something out of it. And so they don't really recognize that it is inappropriate. They just see a reward. That condition submission. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. That sounds um, very similar to the grooming process um, that occurs very often with children, which makes sense because right. um, with intellectual disabilities, they do kind of have the mind of a child. Whereas you or I can value, that's not worth it. It's right. often not that ca the case. You know, right, right. Yeah, I think that's actually very similar with patients who, you know, have like dementia and Alzheimer's. It's yes. that similar thing that they want, you know, the company, they want the reassurance, they want, you know, um, as simple things as ice cream too, you know, or cognitive um, decline puts them at a higher risk you know and especially when we're further into alzheimer's and we forget literally what happened three hours ago 
So that puts up a big barrier, especially if they, I mean, they're not going to remember to tell, you know. Um, and then for people who um, don't have that cognitive decline, it's a matter of, you know, they're homebound. So that means that, you know, they cannot get in the car, do not have a car, maybe can't even leave the house. So that fear of, well, if I lose this person, what do I have? A nursing home, you know? And, or what do I have? Nobody. Some people can't even afford a nursing home. So it's, you know, I think that puts up a big barrier. Um, and also just, you know, not knowing how to voice or the same thing, that submission of not even knowing at this point that it's wrong, maybe because it's been happening for so long. Um, so I think, you know, just asking asking the right questions, giving the right opportunities, because as an RN, I only get to see patients once, but the LPNs get to go in every single week. And thankfully, we get to assess these people and, you know, we're looking at their entire body. So, you know, as for, for bruising and stuff like that, we'd be able to see it or reoccurring UTIs, like knowing what to look for, even when they can't say anything. Yeah. And Lauren, I would imagine with this population too, even if they were able to come forward and say this did happen, mm-hmm. with that cognitive decline, I'm sure you could see individuals um, who just didn't believe them. It's like, oh, they're confused or, right. or they're, yeah. Right. That's so true. Yeah. I would also say one of my first victims when I started working at Rape Counselors um, was an 83-year-old woman. Mm-hmm. And when we asked her, you know, like, I think it was her daughter who asked her, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you tell me? And she said, well, back in my day, we didn't talk about this stuff, you know? Mm-hmm. And so they're right. conditioned the same way that anyone else is, you know, by your environment. That yeah. was, it's still not something that anyone likes to talk about, but this woman was, she knew she was like, a lady doesn't talk about that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. I just had to deal with it. it. Right. Mm-hmm. Oh, my heart. And so it's just something to keep in mind of, just like the kids we're bringing up today or teenagers that we're trying to shift the narrative and get them to think about it differently. We need to do that with our elders too, you know, because it's just now starting to change and, you know, barely, but you know, people are becoming a little bit more open to the topic and trying to raise awareness. So Yeah. Just, just last week, you know, you're asking about our, um, like experience and learnings and stuff. I mean, you guys came out and we shared a great, like working time together, bouncing back and forth. And the education within these populations is so necessary that um, they need to know the boundaries and the lines need to be bold, not blurred between appropriate care and and not appropriate care for sure. So we're really looking forward to everything we're going to do with you guys because that's so important for sure. Me too. I've been hard at work on it all week. Yeah. <laughs> They're definitely the populations that people kind of forget that they are so affected. So they kind of do forget like, oh, they also have to be educated because like while we are educating them on their social skills and their physical skills, like we do forget we should be teaching them personal boundaries and personal autonomy and things like that that are also a part of their everyday life that many people don't think of. Like, um, like teaching them that like not everyone hugs and not everyone um, changes in front of people. Like some, you know, just simple things that, that we forget that they haven't really been taught and that they do need refreshers and to be reminded of things like that. Yeah, 100%. Um, one more thing off of that too is before the Exceptional Foundation, I worked at um, Camp Asco, which is a summer camp for Alabama Special Camp for Children and Adults with Special Needs. And they um, actually stayed with us for, it was like a week at a time, seven weeks. Um, and so instead of being a day program, we as a counselors, I worked there for four years. So we would take care of four summers. So we would take care of them the full week long that they were there, bathing, showering, toileting, everything. And like, that's just a really big thing is like the overexposure. And I'm sure like in the home care, you deal with that as well. Like just because they need that assistance doesn't mean that they like shouldn't have personal boundaries with, Oh, I don't, I don't want to be changed in the middle of the room or, you know, like for us, it was a cabin setting. So like that doesn't mean you just leave the bathroom door open or, you know, something like that. They still need decency and personal respect as well. So. Mm-hmm. And do y'all have any just like last tips 
for others working like in your, both of your vulnerable populations that y'all work with, not even necessarily with like sexual assault in mind, just, you know, y'all both have, are very experienced in like the populations you work in. So just any like last little tips for someone who might not have any knowledge working with elderly or um, special needs? I think a big thing, um, I started working in a nursing home two years ago. So I've been working with the elderly for like two and a half years. Um, if I count nursing school, but, um, I think a big thing is just like loving on people as if they're your own family. Like I'm sure with you guys with special needs population, like loving on them as if that person is your brother or sister. Okay. And I just imagine as if like they're my grandparents, like, so not just seeing them as another patient, but seeing them as someone's family and, you know, I think, you know, working with some nurses who aren't the best nurses or maybe they're a little lazy and they don't do the job fully. So if you see somebody as your family, you're going to do the job fully. You're going to educate them as much as you can. You're going to bathe them properly. You're going to um, make sure that the plan of care that I develop is going to be perfect and it's going to fit their needs. And I'm going to talk to the doctor all the way through, you know, it's, it's, realizing that like this is a person and I think healthcare the actual personhood of people get gets lost very often um and people aren't treated correctly so treat somebody like they're your own family <laughs> for sure um I would also say definitely with our population is awareness so we have been working with them we work with them most of them every day um we see them you know certain or 40 plus hours a week, whatever it may be. Um, so really understanding each participant and their specific personalities and their normal like baseline behavior um, and really being observant of their behavior. That way we do notice like if someone's having an off day, like we know like, oh, like we can talk to them about it and we know when or when not to, you know, step on their toes or, you know, try to push them with questions or whatever. Um, and also knowing like them and their families is really important. Knowing the relationship that they have with their um, families, because that does have a play on their, I guess, personalities and their, um, like how they act during the day. Like we know if they have a rocky relationship with a sibling, then they're going to have good and bad days. But if they come from a family where there's never conflict, there's never, you know, they come in with the best attitudes every day. And then one day they come in just completely down, completely off, like they're normal. And we know, hey, like keep an eye on them, maybe ask questions. So I think it's super important to be observant of uh, the people that we work with. For sure. Yeah. Inside, inside their families and everyday habits and just like them as their oneself. Because there's like a little saying um, in the special needs workers community, I guess. Um, but it's like, if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. And so they're all different. Everybody has different behaviors. And I mean, that goes for everyone. If you've met one human, you've met one human. So yeah, just, just not trying to group anything or assuming, I mean, yeah, just what Piper said and love everybody. <laughs> Simple as that. <laughs> Um, and I like that you both kind of touched on building relationships because, um, like Lauren said, you know, it can kind of be difficult. You can kind of see them as a client or see them as that rather than um, another human. And I think when building relationships, that's when they feel comfortable enough to tell you about sexual abuse if they can communicate that. So I think that's why it's really important to build those relationships because especially in like home health and with individuals with disabilities, there may be a limited amount of people that they are around consistently so that's why it's so important for you to take that time and make that effort to make them feel comfortable um to tell you um because i feel like that's something we kind of try to do too um with anyone we work with but so we always like to end our podcast with one question that we ask all of our guests and that is what is your message to survivors Um, I would say that one thing that I guess that's something that we all say is that it's never um, the survivor's fault and you are a survivor, not a victim. 
Um, and it's okay to um, talk to somebody about it. And it's never anything to be ashamed of. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's really good. Um, just knowing that, like, this this one instance or multiple instances does not define you. That's not part of who you are. Um, and that trauma is trauma, even if it doesn't look like anybody else's or, um, or if it, you know, you feel like it's only you that feels the way that you do. And there's not a timeline on healing. Yeah. It takes everybody a different amount of time to heal. Um, but there is healing. There is light at the end of the tunnel. So, yeah. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us today. Um, And Faith, I don't know if there's anything else you want to say just to end off the podcast that you normally say, but. Um, No, I'm good. Do y'all have any other comments, anything that you feel like needs to be said or addressed? No, I totally agree with what they said on the closing statement. I didn't really, (laughs) they took the words right out of my mouth because, I mean, that's all you can't say. And just be there to support that loved one through and through every, anything and everything that they need. Um, you know, with our population, I will say, this is something I would say is words don't always even, you know, communication isn't always verbal. Just sitting next to somebody is, is sometimes enough for that person. So. Mm-hmm. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us for this episode. Um, we've appreciated it. And for everyone listening, we will see you on the next podcast. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.